Hello, everyone. I am thrilled to welcome you to the Heilbronn Department of Population and Family Health Seminar. Today, we are extremely lucky to have two Texans with us, Cecile Richards and Loretta Ross, to discuss Roe v. Wade and many other things. My name is Terry McGovern. I'm extremely proud to be chair of this department. We focus on health and human rights, sexual and reproductive justice, the health of forced migrants, environmental impacts on all of that, and global health justice and governance, as in vaccine equity. Um, a little about me before I was chair of this department. I was a lawyer, a poverty lawyer, just as the HIV epidemic hit. Um, filed lots of lawsuits over the failure to address the same ne the needs of the populations we'll be discussing today. Um, and my work now is on disrupting structural barriers. Uh, let's talk about, as a brief summary opening, the obsession of various policymakers with restricting the right to abortion. Um, the three, 1,320 state laws restricting abortion over the last 10 years, 90 restrictions in 2021. Many states tried to use COVID as an excuse to restrict abortion. 90% of US counties have no abortion provider. There are five states that have one clinic. Let's just talk for the students in the audience, briefly talk about the history here. There are three major Supreme Court rulings that create a constitutional framework for abortion. You all know in 1973, the US Supreme Court said that the right to privacy in the 14th Amendment protects the right to choose whether or not to have an abortion. Roe also established the state framework on regulation or limiting abortion uh, in the first trimester. It's up to the woman and her doctor, no regulations, no bans in the second, only restrictions that protect the patient's health. In the third, there's regulation is allowed. It's the only exception that abortion cannot be banned. Then we had Planned Parenthood of Southeastern Pennsylvania v. Casey, uh, where basically the state, the court introduced the concept of undue burden. That means that states can regulate, but not, un, not with undue burden. We see this played out then in Women's Whole Health versus Hellerstedt, where SCOTUS ruled in 2016 that two Texas provisions were an undue burden, uh, and they were both trap laws, and I won't go into the details. Um, but Texas is, of course, and we're going to discuss this today, is an example of a state that's had a broad legal strategy to end abortion in the state. They are aggressive, they're creative, um, and the most e recent example, there's a 2017 Texas ban D&E. Um, they we had Gonzalez v. Carhart, where Texas again tried to get away with more. Um, and in 2019, the Women's Health versus Paxton, um, the district court ruled that that the law in question imposed an undue burden. Um, so we have this history in Texas, but of course, the most outrageous of all is Texas Governor Greg Abbott signing SB8 into law, which bans abortion at six weeks gestation, allows private individuals to file lawsuits seeking enforcement of the ban. Um, of course, uh, various groups, Whole Women's Health asked the Supreme Court to block implementation of the law. They did not act. Um, we know that this is the first of its kind, in a sense, an unprecedented scheme to insulate the state from responsibilities, empowers, empowering citizens to act as the state. I'll let my colleagues say more about it, just to say there is a financial incentive, 10,000 in legal fees. Some commentators have likened it to the Fugitive Slaves Act. In, in Texas before this, 90% of abortions were after six weeks, um, vast expansion of who can sue. The whole question, the only exception is medical emergencies, but doctors have to execute a written document, including specific conditions. You both know, we all know lots of potential fatality here, women who can't be pregnant because they need uh, chemotherapy, all kinds of unclear conditions that the doctor could refuse to document. And we're talking about women dying 
heart conditions that lead to cardiac arrest. There are no defenses in this, in this law. State officials are immune. Uh, and we have already seen a surge in neighboring states. Before I turn to uh, my, the, our amazing guests, just to say the Justice Department sued uh, Texas saying you're in open defiance of the constitution. Of course, we ha are all looking at Jack Jackson Women's Health Organization, which comes to the Supreme Court in December. Um, and the basic question there is whether all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. So extremely important. So SCOTUS here would either have to eliminate the rule that states cannot ban abortion before viability, which is generally thought of as 24 weeks gestation or reverse Roe v. Wade altogether. So seven states have maintained pre-Roe bans on abortion. They're currently unenforceable. They could be enforceable immediately if Roe were overturned and 12 states have post row trigger bans. I won't go on and on, you get the picture. And of course I'd love to, but won't give a lecture on all the conditions that get absolutely no attention uh, that would improve the women's, the, the lives of women and children throughout the country and the states that are dedicated to trying to restrict abortion. Um, so to discuss uh, this today, I'm thrilled actually uh, that we have two seasons, uh, seasoned activist advocates, um, wise women who are not only fierce, but are extremely funny and loving and very interested in survival and, and getting women what they need. Uh, Loretta Ross, long-term warrior for reproductive justice, who most recently has been talking a lot about love and calling out and calling in, and as always, getting women what they need. And Cecile Richards, a tough Texan, whose mother was the first governor of the state of Texas, Ann Richards. And of course, to go on, Cecile is a national leader for women's rights and social and economic justice, co-founder of Supermajority, She's author of the New York Times bestseller, Make Trouble. She was president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and Planned Parenthood Action Fund for 12 years. She's always worked to increase affordable access to reproductive health care. She began her career as a labor organizer. She worked for Deputy Chief of Staff, Nancy Pelosi. Um, she was the Deputy Chief of Staff, the House Democratic Na leader, Nancy Pelosi. And let me just go to Loretta is the is i'm so thrilled the professor at smith college in the program for the study of women and gender she teaches courses on white supremacy human rights and calling in the calling out culture she was the national coordinator of the sister song women of color reproductive justice collective she co-created the theory of reproductive justice she was national co-director of the march for women's lives in 2004 the largest protest march in u.s history she founded the National Center for Human Rights Education in Atlanta and launched the Women of Color program for the National Organization for Women, um, was the first national program director of the National Black Women's Health Project. So I, I don't have to tell all of you how lucky we are to have these two women with us today at this moment where people are feeling great anxiety um, here at the school, we have the biggest class that we've ever had. We have the most diverse class that we've ever had. And our students really want to know and keep asking, and I'll go to you first, Loretta, how did we get here? How did this happen? <laughs> well, when I think about how it happened, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, all I can say is that I'm pissed off. <laughs> I am so pissed off and I'm not sure if that's a politically correct term to use. Because in 1968, in Texas, I became pregnant through incest. And because abortion was not an option, I only had a few options. The, the first was I couldn't terminate the pregnancy, so I had to carry it to term. The only other option was whether to give my son up for adoption when he was born. And because I gave birth at a Catholic hospital, they broke protocol and gave me my child 
at the night after he was born when they should have whisked him away so that I wouldn't meet him. And when they put my son in my arms, I kept saying, he's got my face, he's got my face. And then I couldn't go through with the adoption. And then I went from being a scared pregnant teenager to a mom at 14 in Texas. And so from 1968 to being in 2021, still fighting for the protection of vulnerable young girls in Texas, pisses me off. I can't say it any more strongly than that. Because instead of having more options, the women and girls of Texas are facing fewer. So how did we get here? Many of us who looked at this stuff for a number of years understand that the modern anti-abortion movement was built on the back of the older segregation movement that there were people who were opposed to Brown v. Board of Education, who wanted to maintain white supremacy, both legally and factually. And when Ronald Reagan was organizing to, to become president, he and his strategists thought that they would build a base of these segregationists and layer onto them an opposition to a, reproductive rights, but in general and abortion rights in particular. So that was the time a lot of pro-choice Republicans suddenly became anti-choice, like George Bush and Ronald Reagan and a lot of people who formerly supported abortion rights and reproductive rights. They saw it as a political strategy. And then you lopped onto that uh, opposition to LGBT rights and gay rights opposition to immigrants, of course, opposition to perpetual war and imperialism. And then you had what was previously called a moral majority, people who could knit together what looked like disparate issues together into a force that could remake the Republican Party. And so that's what we're looking at, literally. And so that's how we got here. People dedicated to raw political ambition who decided to sell their souls so that they could get power. It has nothing to do with principles. It has nothing to do with integrity. It has nothing to do with honor. It has everything to do with naked political calculation. And that's what we're seeing. So when Trump was elected, he wasn't the cause of what we're seeing. He was an outcome. <laughs> of what had been fomenting since the 1970s in the remaking of what is called the Republican Party. And another thing they never did and chose not to do was to strip the white supremacists and the fascists out of their ranks. For 50 years, we've been saying, if you don't wanna be called you know, fascists or white supremacists, why don't you scrape them off? Why don't you push them away so that you can de be defined as a respectable political party and not a party that's trying to overthrow democracy? And they've chosen not to do so again for raw political ambition. And so that's why, how we got here. I think that those of us who fight for abortion rights though make a mistake if we only think it's about gender. I think it's also about race, it's about class, it's about citizenship, it's about not wanting universal health care. It's not about, it's about wanting to destroy the entire social contract where people are taken care of when they are needy, like with COVID and things like that. And so when we don't have a sufficiently comprehensive analysis about the nature of the threat, then the strategies we choose underperform because they only deal with one issue and not the intersection of all the issues. Our opponents have an intersectional analysis. We don't sometimes. And that's why we created reproductive justice. And I'll talk about that later because okay. I want uh, Cecile to talk about how she sees it from her perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I know that just in Texas, I don't know what that sound is. If somebody, okay. 
text. So Cecile, tell us how we got here and please tell us about yeah. Texas. <laughs> sure, well, it's, I mean, it's such a honor to be on this, um, in this conversation, Terry, with you and with Loretta. And I actually, uh, it's interesting that Loretta and I both come out of Texas and our experiences are are somewhat different, but also I think I I, I agree with her analysis. Um, so right now, I mean, I guess I would say literally how we got here in this moment in Texas is uh, that over the last, I would really say I'm building on kind of where Loretta laid out the framework here of that this has been part of the Republican party apparatus for a long, long time. Really what happened in, in, uh, in addition to that, sort of the, the add on was, um, you know, in 1990, my mother was elected governor of Texas, which was like, I mean, it was this in, in, insane, like stars, moon, everything colliding and somehow magically like a progressive woman um, is elected governor of Texas, unabashedly pro-choice, um, so many things. Uh, and then in 1994, she was defeated by George Bush, the year that the Christian coalition, so-called, not a Christ, it wasn't a Christian group, it was a political group, but it was really to leverage um, right-wing political engagement on a whole host of what they call social issues, although I would say our economic issues, um, gay rights, uh, abortion rights, et cetera. And that really began the takeover of the Republican Party in Texas by the extreme right wing. And so just year, you know, over the years here, we've seen um, an inability of what we would think of in the olden days as sort of like moderate Republicans or business Republicans or whatever. Um, that wing of the party just sort of evaporated and it's now become controlled by folks whose obsession is on ending access to legal abortion, along with a lot of other things. And as, as Loretta said, I mean, whether it's a horrible immigration policy, you know, cruel um, health care policies, a lack of investment in public schools. I mean, just there's a whole host of host of things that have um, that have happened as a result. We now, you know, fast forward to the coming elections in Texas, where Governor Greg Abbott is being challenged, if you can imagine, by people even further to his right, or that's what that's what is in his thinking. And so in a state where already abortion access was extremely difficult, you know, because this recent law is only the last in a series of restrictions that have been placed on people seeking abortion, but in an effort to play to the right wing base of his party um, and to win a Republican primary, he and the Republican leadership in the legislature have now moved to be, frankly, the first, I'd say, state where road no longer is exists. Um, and we can talk about how this is all played out in terms of um, the experience of pregnant folks right now in the state of Texas. But essentially, as you said, Terry, uh, before this bill, probably 90 percent of abortions, safe and legal abortions, were um, were after six weeks. And that that will tell you that it's almost impossible uh, to have access to a safe and legal abortion in the state. As we know, that doesn't mean that abortion doesn't take place. It just means we are going into an era in which um, the health and well-being of people in the state is at enormous risk. And uh, I think to, to Loretta's point, I mean, um, people are going to suffer. I, I, I'd want to add one thing to what Loretta said too, because it's just kind of extraordinary for me. I'm a, I have three kids. I lived in Texas for many, many years. I had an abortion in Texas as a mother of three. Uh, this was a time in which, um, you know, and I, I made that decision because as, as a mom, I, you know, over a whole host of factors and I was able to access safe and legal abortion um, and went on to, to live my life, that is no longer possible in the state of Texas. It's no longer possible for anyone um, with a, the, only the most um, narrow, narrow exceptions. And so it is, we, are at a, we are at a threshold moment here of whether or not we are gonna go back to a time, um, as Dr. Braid has actually written, San Antonio doctor, 
published his op-ed in the in the Washington Post, I believe, uh, who remembers the days before Roe when young, healthy women um, were dying in emergency rooms across the country, and many and docs who were around doing the rounds at those times or going through medical school remember the stories and are committed to not going back um, to that period. Um, I do believe there are a number of things that have to happen. And I assume that's what we're gonna, you know, we'll spend time talking about today. Like, what are the what are the things? But uh, we didn't get here overnight. I guess to to kind of like then highlight a, a Loretta's point. We didn't get here overnight, and we're not going to get out of here overnight. Uh, there is no magic bullet. There's no litigation strategy. Um, although, cheers to all the attorneys who are um, uh, litigating on behalf of people. But there is no immediate fix. And if we don't take politics seriously and make it impossible for people to pass laws and enact laws that eliminate the rights of people, um, in this case, pregnant people, then we will never be out of this. And that that's an element I feel like we collectively as a, as a movement perhaps have not, um, not wanted to dirty our hands with or not really talk about, but I just, I firmly believe it's true. It's a common, it's going to be a combination of healthcare, new creative ways of abortion access. It's going to be culture change. It's going to be lifting up stories. It's going to be building grassroots movements and it's going to be politics. Can I just say one other thing that Aunt, uh, that uh, Cecile will remember? When you're a Texan, they actually worship vigilante culture. You know, that's where the Texas Rangers came from. And so those pictures of men on horseback, horse whipping Haitian immigrants is the same thing that they did to slaves. And they actually do believe in bounty hunters and the rights of citizens to, you know, carry weapons and shoot people and all of this. This is part of that Texas mythology, but also Texas culture. And they were fiercely protective of those immoral things in Texas. You can't even be a Texan without understanding that's the culture in which you grow up. That's why Juneteenth was created in Texas because they withheld news of the Emancipation Proclamation from the enslaved people. And so there's something particularly Texan about the choice to set out a whole vigilante bounty system to attack people for exercising their human right to access abortion. If I can just say one thing in response to that, and then Terry, yeah, I'll let you, yeah. let you get in. But I think, I, Loretta, I agree. And culture is a huge part of what we have to really understand and dissect and call out. I, I do, I, have, I just got back from Dallas, actually, where I grew up and um, talking to folks there. And I, I, I think it's important to distinguish the politics of Texas um, or of the elected officials in Texas and where Texans are. And so, although I agree with you that there is, I mean, who would have thought anywhere else in the country you could come up with a scheme of, you know, bounty hunters uh, to turn in people who are uh, helping people get access to abortion. But I think it's really important that to, at least this is my point of view, is that Greg Abbott, and the Republican-led legislature has done something that is absolutely antithetical to where the vast majority of Texans are. And they, but they've done it, you know, they've done it with impunity. And so if they're allowed to do this, if there is not like, if there are not people in the streets and, you know, uh, enormous, and there's, and there, and unless there is not political fallout for them, they're going to keep doing it. So it's a difference between sort of where people are and what they're willing to fight for. Um, but I, you know, there are a lot of problems in Texas. Um, like we don't have an electrical grid for anyone who lives down there and just went through having their, their parents, um, living without power. Uh, we have, the worst access to healthcare in the country in terms of um, uninsured. And of course the re- legislature and the governor refuses to expand Medicaid. We have high rates of maternal mortality um, and particularly for black women, public education that is underfunded and completely um, uneven. 
those are issues that Texans want action on. There was not a groundswell of people in Texas to say we have to make abortion illegal in the state. And so I do think it's important that we that we um, that we invest in and support the incredible folks, including in the state legislature, who kept going to the floor and fighting the fight here because they are the real champions down there. And I think there is a real um, an opportunity to use this as an organizing moment um, in, in the state. And I, just uh, to to agree with you, one more thing, we need to bring in here the attack on voting rights as well. Right, right. That's also part of their plan. So, so before we turn to the huge question of how we turn this around, which you've begun to kind of both allude to, um, I want to just say, you know, what you just said, Cecile, and what we all know is that, you know, in all of these thousands of bans and attempts, basically, they have all of the folks who care about people's access, who care about reproductive justice, spending all this time and resources to actually make sure that women and people get what they need, right? When they should be working on all these other issues, re reducing maternal mortality, upping access, figuring out why the cervical cancer rates are so high among Latinx women, dealing with, you know, so there's, can, on the one hand, I just do want to give a shout out to the women all throughout and people all throughout the country who are making sure that people still have access to abortion under these ridiculous conditions. Um, so I want to ask you both to talk about that a bit, but I also want to keep pointing out that all of this, instead of doing the work to get people better health care, where these, the, the, this leadership puts all its resources on restricting bodily autonomy um, or voting access or riding horses into innocent people uh, at the border. You know, so, so just could, could either of you say a bit about some of the amazing work that's going on um, despite these restrictions in Texas, for example? Loretta, you wanna go? Yeah, well, I'm part of the reproductive justice movement. And of course, our basic tenets are everybody has a human right to not have a child if they don't want to using birth control, abortion or abstinence and the right to have a child if they want to using midwives, doulas and what have you. And the third tenet is the right to raise our children in safe and healthy environments. So coming from that framework, we centered the most vulnerable people in our lands. So we're going to do whatever it takes to ensure that as few people die or as harmed by this legislation as possible. So we're going to make sure that, you know, the abortion funds and the people working on the ground in Texas have access to do what can only be called abortion tourism now, going to other states to access this, this human right, their healthcare, because your human rights should not be determined by what your zip code is. And, and you know, there's going to be people making sure that the abortion pills and knowledge about those abortion pills is widely known. There are already people going to Mexico uh, to, to access services and to bring back the abortion pills and things like that. So while the fight is happening at the judicial at the court level and the legislative and the policy level, we're spending a lot of energy at the people level, making sure women don't. But the other thing that we have to be bold in saying is this is not pre-row. We know a whole lot more about how our bodies work and how, how to provide abortion services than we did in 1973. And that toothpaste can't be put back in the tube. Millions of us know how to do this now. And so I don't care what the state says, what the church says, what the government says. We are not going to let people die pretending we don't know what we know. And that is how to work with women on the ground and the agencies and service agencies in that state to mitigate the harm as best we can. And some of us are willing to go to jail for that as well. Thank you. Seal? So yeah, maybe just to kind of fill them in a little bit more, and I totally agree um, with Loretta. I mean, the courage 
of people on the ground right now who, of course, are, I mean, are risking so much and, um, but I think are doing the work that they were um, set out to do, which is to make sure that people, uh, that we take care of women and pregnant people and whatever that means. Um, uh, it's kind of, I guess, another piece of this for those of you who are, who are not from Texas or haven't spent time down there is, you know, it's actually kind of struck because I, I was at uh, a Planned Parenthood event on uh, last week and I had kind of forgotten just because I hadn't been in that space for a while, but, you know, essentially the reproductive health care um, community, the public reproductive health care community, it's a, these are public, um, this is public health care with no public funding. It is literally like a parallel universe. It's, it is, and not just abortion, it is birth, it's everything. It's, it, and so already we are dealing with a state where the lack of support for public health care is tremendous. And I was with, um, talking with Congresswoman Veronica Escobar, who is uh, from El Paso, and talking about they're already uh, a, an underserved community in terms of healthcare access, this now just layered on top. And of course, uh, El Paso being a place where whether you're going to Mexico or going to New Mexico has now become a gateway um, that they're trying to manage people who are trying to get there to get to a place where they can act access safe and legal abortion. And she talked about, um, you know, a doctor that she had just visited with who said, I'm going to move. I can't do this work anymore in this state. It's not, a, you know, and so I think the um, abortion deserts, as we call them, or reproductive health care deserts are even going to get more, more um, profound. Uh, it's a state that is, you know, it's a, you know, big urban areas and lots of counties where there's no health care access. And so particularly as Loretta's talking about how are we taking care of people, there are people that live, uh, I think right now the average drive to um, access safe and legal abortion is 250 miles, um, which of course is completely out of reach of so many people if you live. So if you're a rural person, if you're a uh, woman of color, if you're a teen, and the stories we're hearing of teens who have literally no place to go now um, are, are, um, are so deep and so profound. So first order of business, I guess, in terms of what do we do, you know, first order of business is take care of people, right? And I do think that's like, I mean, it's like you got to secure the home front, make sure that people have information, that they have, that the abortion funds have resources, that people are able to um, give people as many options um, as, as they can. Um, the second is though, we need to make sure, and this became so important in the whole women's health case before the Supreme Court, we need to make sure that the stories of people affected and families and community affected are being told and are being heard. Uh, I, and already I've heard stories that just, as we will, I mean, as every day, there are going to be stories of people denied their rights and denied the access to healthcare that they need. But third is, and this is maybe, I'll just kind of throw this out there, but it's what I have been thinking about is, you know, in Texas for all these years, and frankly, a lot of other states, you could be anti-abortion as a politician, um, and just say all you cared about was the unborn. And it was kind of a free ride because we had, a, you know, there was the Supreme Court that would declare laws basically unconstitutional. And you really never had to take any responsibility. We're never held accountable for the pain and suffering and cruelty of your actions. That has to change. And this is, to me, the Republican Party, who is now, that is, because this also, I mean, another thing I'd like to just abuse, it's not like this law just kind of like popped out of nowhere. This has been, again, to Loretta's earlier point, this has been a many, many year process of the Republican Party to try to make safe and legal abortion a thing of the past. So now they're like the dog that caught the bus in Texas. They just did that, right? They just did that. And now they have to be held accountable in a way that I don't believe the general public um, has been aware of, uh, and because it's going to take two, it's going to take more than us who are committed to these issues. This is going to require reaching out. And I love the work that Loretta is doing. It's like, because people, 
know, a lot of people just don't know and they're not going to get it right. Sometimes they're going to use the wrong words and whatever, but we need to make this, we need to make this movement massive um, and spread everywhere um, because it's going to take more than just the people who have been um, doing this work all their lives. This is when we have to engage um, everyday people who do not want a world, do not want to live in a country um, where people and women are dying. Um, and, and, and of course we have to do everything we can to keep that from happening. Thank you. Sir. Can I just say one thing yeah. in response yeah. to what Cecile said, cause she's absolutely right. I agree 100%. But since I've been doing this work for 50 years, <clears throat> I unfortunately came to the realization that telling our stories about how we suffer is insufficient. It's not that they don't know, it's that they don't care. And that's where political accountability matters because the one thing they care about is votes and getting elected. And 100%. So, you know, I, I used to think, well, maybe they just don't know the suffering that's going on. Of course they should have empathy and sympathy for people that they may not have known about or didn't realize the unintended consequences of what they're doing. Call me cynical, but I've come to the realization that they know and they don't care. That's a different animal. So I wanna get to the ouchy point. Well, what do you care about? Cause that's where I'm aiming my energy. So, so on that note, I think uh, in the opening, you talked, Loretta, about kind of the right wing, and you did as well, Cecile, the Republican, the extreme portions of the, of the Republican Party, being able to link together these issues in a certain way that perhaps we haven't done as good a job on our side. Of course, reproductive justice is exactly that, right, Loretta? It's about looking more comprehensively, but um, can you say a bit more about how we get ourselves out of this? You have both talked about political power, but you've also talked about a kind of a comprehensive approach that isn't so kind of siloed off. Um, you know, more like what the right wing has done. Uh, so, so my question is, A, how do we get ourselves out of this? And, and, and you've mentioned some of the components, but, but what else? My students always say, we're sick of hearing about the problems. We wanna know solutions. Um, and of course, this is a hugely complex set of factors, but thoughts on kind of the big question, how do we get out of this? You've said culture, you've said kind of a more comprehensive view, but any, any more thoughts on this? Cecile, I'll let you go. Um, yeah, sorry, I was just like, you, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, as I said, there isn't like a, look, I remember when Donald Trump was elected and people would just like, come up to me like on, you know, on the street with these white eyes, like now what am I supposed to do is if somehow like, oh my gosh, there's this one thing you could do. And then we're going to, you know, he's not going to be here anymore. And as we saw, um, it took four years of organizing and people in the streets and folks rushing town hall meetings and a lot of other things. And so I, I guess I just want to say to the students who I understand are impatient for victories and success, that this is like, um, this is long, long haul work. And I also do believe, I think Loretta and I are in the same place on this, that it's going to take a lot. It's, it's, it's like an ecosphere of things that have to happen and different people are good at different things. So it's not like everybody has to do the same thing. Although I will, I, 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 and I also believe we're at the same, in the same agreement that until this is the pain point or the ouchie or whatever, <laughs> Loretta, the word you use is, until this actually costs people their jobs in politics, they're gonna keep doing it. And so we just gotta get really serious uh, about people losing their jobs, elected officials losing their jobs because they did this. Um, I was, I mean, it's really interesting and we won't, we don't have time to go through all the political history, but I mean, we, last week, the House of Representatives 
took a vote on the Women's Health Protection Act, um, which is really basic. It's basically just saying abortion should be legal, right? And I'm, I don't, you know, we could go through all the bells and whistles. It's not a controversial bill. Not a single Republican in Congress voted for it. That says to me that we have an entire party, and there are, as we know, there are people in the Republican Party who, um, they don't, this is not their issue. They don't ever think, you know, they don't ever think about it. They, um, a lot of them have probably had abortions or their family members have had abortions or they've paid for abortions. But so it's not, they're not doing this because of some like commitment to um, an anti-choice point of view. It's just because it's politically convenient because then they don't have to have a primary opponent or all the other things. And they think they can attract some, some voters. Um, we have to change that dynamic. And again, I think there, I agree with Loretta, you're right, storytelling in and of itself is not enough. But I was so struck when the whole women's health came down. And of course we had Justice Ginsburg on the court there but literally the stories of women for the first time of any argument I'd ever seen argued before this reward, we had three women on the court, you know, and between Justice Ginsburg and Kagan and Sotomayor, they were like, they, they brought women into the room, into the Supreme Court hearing in a way that I, I never had seen before. So I, I think making sure that we are lifting up these stories of what what it looks like to be in a country in a state or a country where abortion is no longer available in a legal and safe way i do think is important but it's it's insufficient it's not it's not going to be everything i think we need more movements um i mean there are big organizations and there are small organizations and they're probably not even enough and so i guess i'm i'm a big believer in just like no one's coming to save us right everybody's just got to get out there and do their thing and it's not going to all be, it's going to be messy and it needs to be messy. It needs to be uh, almost anarchistic. It just needs to be, I, we need people who are in office who have done this to feel the heat. And there's a lot of ways uh, for that to happen. And then I just, I do believe we have to vote and we have to run for office. And you can look at some of the incredible um, women who ran against incumbents and got elected and are stirring things up in Congress, but we need to be doing that in every single state because the, the, the pain point that Loretta just described is so important, but unlike a lot of other things, the interesting thing about the abortion issue is actually people in this country they may not agree on everything, but fundamentally, if you say, if you ask folks whether they would want pregnant people to be making their decisions about a pregnancy or they want politicians and government, it their vote is not for politicians and government. And so we actually have, I think, fertile organizing ground, um, but we have to make this an issue that is too painful for people to ignore, whether they're in office or not. And for me, it all starts with articulating not just what you're fighting against, but what you're fighting for. Because I'm always saying you have to have a vision for when you win, because <laughs> otherwise you'll just replicate the system that you work to defeat, because that's all you know. And so I believe, of course, that reproductive rights are human rights, women's rights are human rights, trans rights are human rights, et cetera. Abortion is a human right. So that's my floor. That's what I'm fighting for, where everyone has full enjoyment of their human rights. But I also think that to get there, we're going to need every generation, every identity, every almost every political perspective, because I'm not trying to call in the fascists and the white supremacists, but everybody else who doesn't believe they should be a card carrying member of the Klan or the Proud Boys, I want them on our side. And so that's why I think we have to understand that how we do the work is as important as the work we do and, and engage in more calling in instead of pushing out, simply because people don't perfectly align with us that we have to build that power of diverse opinions in order to create those ouchy punishments for people who want to violate people's human rights. Strategically, one of the things we've done as reproductive justice activists 
is move conversations around reproductive justice into other social justice movements. So if you're working on housing availability and affordability or voting rights or transportation issues or food justice, we explain to people how to connect the dots to say these, you know, whether or not a pregnant person has a bedroom to put a child in affects their reproductive decision making or whether they've got a safe school to send a child to affects reproductive decision making. So we spend a lot of time working on other issues that aren't necessarily biological so that people understand those intersections uh, like how voting rights, because the, by the way, the attack on voting rights is badly framed as an attack on black people's voting rights, which it is. I'm not saying that it's not because they were, they did the insurrection on January 6th, not because white votes weren't counted. They did the insurrection because black votes were counted <laughs> and produced an outcome they didn't like. But at the same time, when you look at the voting rights suppression in states where there's too few people of color to matter, you actually understand that they have narrowed their target to young people in those states because they don't want them voting the way that they don't like to white women. They are really micro-targeting people to disenfranchise everyone who does not vote to keep them permanently in power. So we have to reframe even voting rights as an issue for young people, for women, for immigrants, all of that, instead of just a classic, it's a black-white framing and things. So those are the kinds of things we can do because one statistic that scares the devil out of them, I wish it did, but I mean, that's a phrase we have in Texas, is that every white demographic in America voted for Trump in the 2020 election, except one. 56% of young white voters between the ages of 18 and 29 voted against white supremacy. They voted for Biden. It's their own kids whose votes they're trying to suppress because they can't stand that outcome. And we need to just keep hammering that these people are demographically doomed and we can build the power to make sure that they're pimples on the ass of time that they should be. Demographically doomed, thank you, Loretta. Um, I just wanna encourage the audience to send in questions. We have some questions to begin with. Um, I'll start with the, can you describe some specific actions people who don't live in Texas can take to support your, our goals? Um, and then related, what will the pain point to get folks out in the streets be? Um, I see complacency as a problem. Um, I would just like to say before I turn it over to you, um, having been a young lawyer when the HIV epidemic hit, I saw, ACT UP and many women of color aligned with ACT UP do what I would have to call joy as joyful resistance in the context of dying of AIDS and not being recognized of dying of AIDS, having to fight to be recognized that they were dying of AIDS. I saw the most creative, robust, both caretaking of one another, but also protests. So I, for example, will be at SCOTUS next Monday getting arrested because there are moments that you have to protest. So, uh, so I think there are demonstrations all throughout the country this coming Saturday. Um, so that's one, before I turn it over to my esteemed colleagues, um, I would put protest, um, exercising your First Amendment rights on the list. Loretta? Well, for me, since I was born too late to actually deal with segregation, I always thought all the good stuff happened before I was born and I kind of missed that I wasn't able to be part of the, the anti Jim Crow movement. But I've learned that we're at that lunch counter moment when those young people were brave enough to, to sit at those lunch counters and get spit upon and beaten and all of that stuff. We're at that tipping point of whether or not this is going to be a country that's democratic where we, we do believe in freedom and pluralism and inclusion, or is it going to be a white supremacist country that where the people, where the civil war 
is finally concluded in all the wrong ways, because we're still in that unending civil war, whether or not we're white supremacists or democratic. That's really the big existential debate we're in right now. And the civil war has never ended. And that's why we had the, the Confederate flag in the US Capitol, because the civil war has never ended. And so we're at that lunch counter moment to finally conclude the civil war. And the question is, are you recognizing how important this historical moment is? And, and not everybody has to be on the front line sitting at the French count. I don't wanna call out people who, who don't have the bandwidth, who wanna be bystanders and all of that, but at least don't make our opponents stronger. Don't, 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 don't give in to the dark side, the dark force, right? And, but that's, it's very exciting as a way, because I, like I said, I thought the good stuff happened before I was born, and now I'm finding out, <laughs> no, it's not. Actually, I get to leave a big fingerprint on where history is going from now. And so I want people to feel that excitement and joy that I'm feeling right now, because this is our moment to be like the history books where we write about us, about we stood up against injustice, not without fear, because we're always afraid. But the bravest thing to do is to be afraid and do the right thing anyway, like those people sitting on the, at those lunch counters in the 50s. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like you here. I guess I just would like, I agree. Our history hasn't been written yet. And so we are the writers. And, and also I want to pick up on something Loretta said there at the end, which is I, I, I just think everyone's going to have to do more than they thought they were going to have to do. And that means, yeah, doing something that makes you uncomfortable, maybe. Maybe it means doing something that scares you a little bit. Because um, I noticed someone wrote in the chat, you know, does do, will marching um, on October 2nd or being arrested or whatever it is, will it matter? And it's like, like what will really matter is if we don't. And Look, we are living through, you know, I think for a lot of people, the last four years of trauma um, under the Trump administration did create this sort of sense of like, okay, can everyone just now go back and like work on their garden and, you know, spend time with their children and stuff. And the truth is we can't, um, we can do that, but this is a moment. And I, I'm with Loretta. Um, it's, it's energizing. It's, it's maddening. I'm, I'm so angry, but I'm also so motivated and so in, inspired by what, what people are doing. So I guess I think just two or three quick things. One, yes, protest always. First order of business. Uh, two, vote. Even if you really don't care that much or don't want to, you've got to because um, we are moving. I mean, Texas is becoming a totalitarian state where you can't vote, you can't get an abortion, and pretty soon you won't be able to do pretty much anything Greg Abbott doesn't want you um, to do. If you don't have anything else you can do, um, contribute to the abortion funds in Texas. They need you. Um, they are helping people every every single day. Um, and I think the the last thing I would say is you we have to keep this story alive. There's a lot of problems in the world right now. And so I do think whether it's sharing stories, whether it's continuing to um, lift up what's happening in places like Texas, you know, I was talking to someone the other day who said, well, you know, well, it's Texas. Like, you know, who cares what happens in Texas? I live in X. And I think we have to really change that. And I, I have seen experiences of, I mean, we all witnessed what happened with a family separation at the border. People who didn't live at the border were um, just incensed and raised hell. We're seeing that with what's happened with the border patrol uh, with patients. We saw that in the Black Lives Matter movement. We need to do the same for the abortion rights movement. It cannot be okay anywhere in this country that anyone um, cannot access safe and legal abortion. And so that's going to require people who don't live in Texas to tell these stories as well. You know, um, thank you both. I think we have a few sets of questions, but the first one is, uh, so law can be a good thing or a bad thing. Is it okay to break the law? Um, and I wanna ask you both that, but I wanna say it was once a legal contract in the US to sell a black person, right? So um, this is how I start when I teach. 
often. Um, so I'll, I'll throw that question out. Is it okay to break the law? And then the other, we have a series of questions about the role of men. Um, what role should men be playing in any of this? And um, what do you think works to get men to take action? <laughs> <laughs> I had a funny flashback because in 2011, I was down in Mississippi working against an abortion a bill that tried to declare, you know, personhood at the time of conception. And I remember being in a bar talking to a lot of men about them opposing the personhood bill. And they didn't see it as their issue until I said, do you want every time you have unprotected sex to expose you to a paternity suit? Because this, 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 Unprotected sex act means that you're going to have people lined up suing you for child support. <laughs> and they were horrified at the thought. And I said, this is what that kind of bill means. So what I found is that you can actually work even in situations where the person doesn't have empathy for another person's situation. They have a lot of concern for their own. And as you can speak to that concern, which is kind of like a crass way to do it because we wish the world was more empathetic like we need in COVID and stuff, you can, you, you can actually reach people. And so just like we found with the anti-violence movement, a lot of men didn't care about rape, domestic violence until it happened to someone they knew or someone in their family or someone, you know, so, Unfortunately, people are very self-centered and you have to use that strategy. But I wanna go back to your earlier point. It is not unusual for governments to write laws that are, immo that are legal yet immoral. I mean, the US government legitimized slavery, which everyone knows is immoral. We legitimized the massacre of Native Americans in a genocide, legal, but immoral. Nazi Germany legalized the Holocaust, but it was immoral. And so to legalize this human rights assault upon pregnant people, just because it's legal, does not make it moral. And so the question becomes, where is your line in the sand? Do you stand up for what is right? Or do you only stand up for what is legal? <laughs> because governments will legalize a lot of immoral stuff because it's convenient, it's profitable, and they kowtow to a lot of financial interests who do not have the people's morality or human needs as a priority. And so I have long understood, this is something we understood in the civil rights movement, the law is only going to be as good as we make it be. I mean, the acts that we used to fight the Ku Klux Klan with were written right after the Civil War. But it took a civil rights movement to make America use its own laws and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so we can't put all our eggs in the hope that the law will keep up with morality. The law often follows our moral lines in the sand, not ahead of them. Thank you. Cecile, anything to add on the men point or no? Well, one, I mean, I just, Loretta's completely right on the, the difference between, I mean, that yeah, yeah, we are obligated to challenge laws that are immoral. And I think, again, doctors are doing that in Texas now. Yeah. They're taking right. care and yeah. their sworn responsibility is to take care of their patients and that requires violating the law. And so I think they're, they're a good example of that. Um, look, I think there's a deafening silence among men in this country, and it's really pissing me off. And I, um, I, and it's not our job to to like get them to do to do this. I just, I do think though, and I, I guess to Loretta's point earlier, I'm more hopeful about a generation um, of young people for whom who who see these issues as human rights issues and not that it's somebody's somebody else's responsibility um 
so yeah, it's, it's time we get more ores in the water. Um, but something, and I know Loretta hasn't talked about it here, but I just feel like part of what Loretta is doing in this country, which is just so profoundly important, is recognizing that if we're going to bring more people into our movement, it, it's going to be messy and it's going to be imperfect. And people are going to use the wrong term sometime and they're not going to know the history. And she has shown more grace um, than anyone I know of I mean, being willing to talk in a bar with men in Mississippi is a classic example of just trying to actually open yourself up to where other people are coming from. Because it, if we're not growing, we're not a movement. And um, so Loretta, I guess I just wanna maybe use this opportunity to either invite you to say something about that and if not, or if nothing more, just to thank you for that because um, if it's just all of us on one little island that agree with each other, we're not going to get there. Well, I'm a proponent of calling people in. And it's not a phrase I created. As a matter of fact, this 18-year-old trans man named Lone Trans actually invented the term at 18, you know, out of the mouth of young people, right? When, when they noticed how vicious the internet had become. And so they name the behavior. And so all I've done is try to create a movement based on calling in principles and tactics and teach people how to do it. And I have an online $5 online class on it every Tuesday night. You can get it on my website. I kind of like want to be the Walmart of social justice education. <laughs> $5, that's all it costs. Anyway, but when I was in my 20s, I was the director of a rape crisis center, the first one, and I had to teach feminist theory to incarcerated men who had raped and murdered women. And I think that was my first calling in moment because as a rape survivor, it scared me to death to go talk to rapists. But I found that once I told them my story, then that opened up the floodgates for, the, to tell, for them to tell me their stories about how they became violators in the first place usually with a lot of trauma in their past, and no one comes out the womb saying, I'm gonna grow up and mess over people. Human rights violators are created unless they're born pathological, and that's not how it generally happens. Then when I worked with Reverend Vivian doing anti-Klan work, Reverend Vivian used to say, when you ask people to give up hate, then you need to be there for them when they do. So I didn't like his message, I thought he was crazy because the, the Ku Klux Klan hated black people. I was okay with hating them back. <laughs> Sounded like a good deal to me, but he was right. Once I started learning to participate in deprogramming people who had been in the Klan and the neo-Nazi movement. And once I got to know them, I couldn't hate them anymore. And so I'm just saying that Human beings have much more in common than the politics that say want to divide us. We just want to do the right thing, take care of our families, live a joyful life, respect our values and stuff like that. And so I'm teaching people how to go underneath people's identity labels or political affiliations and go underneath and, and talk to people value to value. And even if we have different strategies for working on those values, we can agree that people should be able to live in their homes in comfort and safety, that our children deserve to go to good schools, that we should have water that is not poisoned to drink. We should have health care. And so when you can put in your mental parking lot your visceral reaction to people using the wrong words or saying things you don't agree with and go underneath those words to find values you can really peel, invite people into conversations instead of fight. And so that's what I've dedicated my life to doing, how to invite people into conversations instead of fight so we can build the power to change these human rights violations we all have to endure. I think that's, I think that's profound, uh, Loretta, and you have given us all a gift with all this work you've been doing. I do think there's a lesson too. I think in these increasingly complicated times, 
and groups that are doing this work are driven by their donors to get credit for what they're doing. It creates a whole lot of uncomfortable dynamics and infighting and they're kind of pushed to, to say, I am the one who delivered this victory. And we all know victories are about many different uh, dynamics, right? So I think we, when we think about how the right wing has been smart, I hate to say it, we need to think about what is happening to our communities as well around kind of pressure to, to not recognize others' contributions, to maybe be out there saying, I need credit for this. There's a part of what you say, what you speak about, Loretta, that to me speaks to that as well, that we have to pull back the lens and take a look at the forces at work here and remember to maybe call in sometimes rather than call out with some of our colleagues as well. Cecile, anything to add there? No? Agre no, just agreed. And I, uh, I think that's, I think that's so right. Um, Loretta, just, we just, we have a lot of work to do. And I know we spend, we do spend as progressives or in these different movements, we have a lot of time um, aiming at each other as opposed to the real folks who are trying to end access, you know, build a state where we can't, can't vote all the things. And so I just think, yeah, taking a beat and thinking about our actions and our words and how we're trying to build, um, build bigger um, and grow our movements uh, is really important. Okay, just two, I think, questions that are good for the final, for the final eight minutes here. Um, first is for Ms. Ross, thank you for your incredible leadership. Um, what is the future, what do you think about the use of reproductive justice terminology by organiz organizations that are not found by or rooted in black communities? Is it appropriate for white-led non-governmental organizations to use this term? Um, and then secondly, to you both, do we take inspiration from intersectional approaches of feminist movements in other countries like the Green Wave? Uh, so, so those are the two final questions. Well, the beauty of reproductive justice created by 12 Black Women in 1994, of which I was one, is that even though it was Black women that created it, it doesn't only apply to Black women. It's a universal theory because it's based on human rights. And everybody has the same human rights. It's just that our intersectional identities and vulnerabilities tell us what we need differently. So if you think about it, like every child has a human right to an education, but a blind child might need her books in Braille. She doesn't have more human rights than a sighted child. She has special needs. And so reproductive justice is not a race-based framework. It's a human rights and criteria-based framework. And so if you respect the criteria of human rights, if you respect the criteria that those who are us who created have attached to it about using the human rights framework, making sure it's intersectional, making sure that you center on the needs of the most vulnerable, that you link the global issues to domestic issues, because most of our privileges in America are earned based on the exploitation of the global South kind of thing. If you use the criteria, it doesn't matter the race or the identity of the organization. It matters whether they're in integrity with those criteria. So please don't reduce it to thinking of it as a race-based frame because basically you're arguing that black women can't create universally applicable theory. And I would ask you to think of the concept of intersectionality you might've heard of <laughs> to deny that concept. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> any, any, any thoughts still on the third wave or the, the inspiration from other countries? The green, um, rather not the third well, green wave. Yeah. I mean, no, I, but I, I don't know that I have any particular response to that. But I do. I guess it's it's related to what Loretta said, and that I, I think the power of an intersectional framework is sometimes it's it's like it takes years, and then you look up and go, oh wow, something happened. And I would just point to what's happening in this country 
for issues that the reproductive justice community and leaders have been raising for forever are actually central to what this new administration is trying to get passed in Congress. Things that we that have been issues forever, whether it's um, lack of access to affordable health care or housing or um, child care, or as uh, you know, Loretta so eloquently talked about earlier, it's just the the ability to raise a child, raise a family with the basic things that every family wants. And so I think it's important. Sometimes I think we use words that are very academic and it's like, it's kind of, it can be a little bit, um, you know, us or them. And, and I think sometimes these are just concepts that they have a name, but not everybody knows the name. And so I think it's important to call it where you go, actually, this is a huge success of the reproductive justice movement is literally changing the national agenda, even though it may not be called that, that was, that was the impact. And anyway, I know, I know we're talking to a bunch of students and I know everyone's very intellectual and academic and stuff. And sometimes though, I, I think it's important to step back and go, this is huge success is that, um, and the, and the, the conversation is happening finally in this country around race and healthcare access, um, uh, which is the reproductive justice community has been talking about forever, but finally people in Congress are talking about it. I mean, it is, so I don't know, it's just maybe more an observation of the power of the ideas, even if people don't always get the language right. Uh, and, and just again, sort of a, um, and gratitude for, for people who have been pushing this for a long, long time, long before it was popular. Can I just say one thing about the term pro-choice? Because a lot of people mistakenly think that we created the term reproductive justice to, to drive the term pro-choice out of use. And that's absolutely wrong. The term pro-choice is a great term for talking about the fight for abortion rights. It's just that we chose another term to talk about intersecting you know, housing and transportation and racism and infrastructure and international global agreements and stuff. We just chose another term, but that doesn't mean where we intended to or do we need to drive the term pro-choice out of use. That was not, as a matter of fact, people who have that perception actually don't realize that for us to have problematized the term pro-choice would have meant that we would have had to center white women in our lens. And we didn't, we centered ourselves. It wasn't about white women at all. <laughs> but there are narratives that say, well, we had problems with white women, so that's why they did that. I'm like, no, nah. we were talking about what we wanted for black women. That's Thank a different you. conversation. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid uh, I'm afraid we're actually at the end of our time. I want to say that um, I really I really appreciate both of you. I think when we talk about um, people who've been in the struggle a really long time and continue to be open to being challenged and open to discussion, I definitely think of you two. I think I say to uh, young people or people who are just completely you know freaked out at this moment, um, think of our ancestors, right? Think of all that they've taught us. Uh, we, we can, you know, we can figure this out. Um, I also really invite people to look at the recent additions to the Supreme Court, who these people are that have our lives and our rights in their hands. Um, please take a look at who these people are, um, because I think the hypocrisy and the lack of caring about human rights is quite apparent. Um, so I do believe uh, we have a, a righteousness to what we're doing that, uh, that we can never forget. Um, so I thank you both for your grace and your humor and your time today. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing all of you somewhere, uh, somewhere at a protest or otherwise. And, and thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks.